Are you ready to revolutionize your relationship with money? Welcome to the Finding Financial Freedom podcast with The Frugal Position, where Dr. Disha Spath will be your companion on this exciting financial adventure. Get ready to conquer debt, build wealth, and embrace a mindful spending lifestyle that will empower you to live life on your own terms. Pearson Rabbits' story begins with Dr. Stephanie Pearson, a passionate ob at the height of her career. But then, a shoulder injury struck during a precipitous delivery. Her dreams were shattered, leaving her unable to practice medicine. Determined to make a difference, Stephanie became an advocate for her peers, guiding them through the complex disability process. Alongside insurance expert Scott Rabbits, Stephanie founded Pearson Rabbits, a company determined to approach insurance differently. Together, they set their mission to educate and empower physicians to protect their most valuable asset, their income and the most important people in their life, their family. Today, Pearson Rabbits serves the medical community in all 50 states. At Pearson Rabbits, they understand the unique concerns of physicians. Physician-founded and physician-focused, Pearson Rabbits builds human connections before they create quotes. Life can change in an instant. It's hard to imagine that a sudden illness or injury could leave you and your family in a devastating financial situation. But with a little planning and guidance, you can prepare for every possibility. Visit PearsonRabbits.com to schedule your consultation with the Pearson Rabbits advisor. Welcome back to Finding Financial Freedom with the Frugal Physician, your go-to podcast for mastering the art of financial well-being. I'm your host, Dr. Disha Spath. And in today's episode, we're diving deeper into the world of sophisticated travel hacks through points. We're thrilled to have Dr. Devin Gimbel, the renowned retired physician and credit card points guru, back on the show. She's here to reveal advanced strategies for credit card points hacking and how to turn your everyday spending into extraordinary travel experiences. Great to have you with us again, Devin. How are you? I am doing so well. Thank you for having me here. I always love chatting with you. This is my favorite topic, obviously, to talk about. So I'm just really excited for us to dive even deeper into the world of credit cards and points and award travel today. Yes, I am so excited because there's just so much to talk about and we can't cover it all in one episode. I really, really want to kind of dive deeper into the advanced credit card hacking techniques that you use and teach in your courses and in your Facebook group. I know that there's a lot out there that I don't know and I can't wait to get into it. So let's start. Can you share some advanced techniques in credit card point hacking that go beyond just getting the sign up bonus? Because that's kind of where my game ends. Just to say, you know, that is where I think almost everybody starts. So it's not that you're in the wrong place or you've done anything wrong. It's that there are levels to learning this, just like there are levels to learn any new skill or any new topic. And I think this is something that I see really commonly with people where they start to scratch the surface, right? It's sort of like, all of a sudden you realize this whole world is open, right? There's a lot of us who are walking around who don't even realize, you know, what credit card points are or what we can do with them. And usually what happens is people hear about it either from a friend or they stumble on a podcast, right? Or a Facebook group and kind of the light bulb goes on. There's the moment of, wait a minute, you know, if I'm someone who loves to travel, here's a method for me to be able to earn this alternate form of currency, you know, points or miles, turn that into travel, save myself a ton of cash, this sounds amazing, right? And sort of the next logical step that so many people take is learning that sort of first level like you did. Oh, I can sign up for a new rewards credit card, especially if, you know, I understand how this works. You earn that first initial welcome bonus or sign up bonus. And that makes a lot of sense. But most people kind of stop there either because they get overwhelmed or confused or they kind of don't know what to do next. And so I like to tell people nothing's gone wrong you're taking the first of many logical steps in this process and earning the new kind of welcome bonus on a credit card that really is just scratching the surface of what you can do in terms of points earning. And it's necessary and it's useful, but we don't have to stop there. And when I think about more advanced techniques in terms of the credit card and points world, I think about two main categories. Like category number one are what are our techniques for earning the points to begin with, right? Like how can we most strategically optimize the money we're already spending. So not going out and spending money on extra things or buying things we don't want, but how can we really strategically optimize the money that we're already spending to earn as many points as possible? So it's kind of like category number one. And then category number two in terms of points earning is, okay, once we've been earning all these amazing points, you know, what do we do with them? And I think there are some very basic ways 
to earn points and very basic ways to use points. And then from there, like I said, we can always add complexity to the system. And so when I think about the very basic way of earning points, you touched on it. We can open up new rewards cards, earn a nice big welcome bonus, and start to build up our points balances from there. But if we want to start thinking about Great. Once we got that under our belt, we feel kind of comfortable with that. What are some more advanced ways that we can earn points? And I think especially depending on the audience that we're talking to, and I do kind of work specifically with and speak specifically to people who have probably higher than average spend, either because of their personal expenses or their business owners. And so they have business expenses. And so I think for that group of people, and everyone can take this into consideration, but especially if you do have a decent amount of spend every year, is kind of beyond the welcome bonus. What are some of the things that people need to keep in mind? And I think one of the most critical things that can affect people's ability to earn points is being very deliberate about the rewards cards they're signing up for. And what I mean by that is, if you're based in the US and you have access to the sort of US financial system, we have over 100 different points and miles earning credit cards we have access to. And even people who are very enthusiastic and deep in this hobby like I am, even I don't have all 100 of those, right? So all of us are going to have to make choices about which are the cards that are the best fit for me. And one of the ways that we can do that is by evaluating the different rewards cards and specifically looking for ones that give us what are called bonus points for categories of spend that we tend to spend the most money on. So an example is there are some points earning cards that will give you extra points for grocery spend. For a lot of us, that can be a significant area of spend. If card A is going to let you earn one point for every dollar you spend on groceries, but card B is going to let you earn four points for every dollar that you spend on groceries, it makes a lot of sense to try to get card B specifically for your grocery spend. And that's just one example. But I think learning how to evaluate different rewards cards and really zeroing in on which ones are going to be the most valuable for me based on the categories I tend to spend money on, and then the cards that are going to offer increased bonus points for spend in those categories. So that's one kind of very straightforward way to turn up the volume on your points earning. And when we talk about that second category, which is points redeeming or using your points for travel, I think the very kind of baseline entry level step that almost everyone goes through when it comes to points redeeming is a lot of us will have what are called transferable or flexible points. And these are the points that we can earn on cards like the Chase Ultimate Rewards points earning cards or Maybe you have some American Express points earning cards or a Capital One Venture card that earns Capital One points. And what most people do in the beginning is when they have their points that are attached to a bank credit card like that, when they want to use them, they just log into their credit card account and they click on the button in their credit card account that says redeem for travel, right? So you then get taken to Chase's what's called a travel portal. You know, it looks like Expedia or booking.com. You type in where you want to go, when you want to go there. And then you can just use your points directly through your travel portal. To me, that's sort of the baseline that most people first start doing when they get into using their points, because that's the only thing that most people realize is the way that they can use their points. And it's not a bad way. It's just that there are so many other ways to get a lot more value out of your points, i.e. get a lot more potential cash value from your points. And so when I think about kind of advanced award travel techniques in terms of redeeming points... Once you move on beyond using your points directly for travel through your credit card account itself, the next thing that most people really learn to do, which is opens up a huge area of opportunity for people to get a ton of value from their points, is really learning how to leverage what are called the transfer partners of your credit card point currency itself. So for example, if you have Chase, you can move your Chase points completely out of your Chase credit card account and you can move them to an airline or hotel transfer partner like Air France airline or Hyatt hotels. And when you learn how to do this, this is when you can start getting multiple times higher value from your points than when all you know what to do is strictly use your points for travel through your credit card account itself. I mean, I totally agree. The travel portals are kind of treated like they are third party vendors to, you know, the Hyatt and the Air France's. When you go and you redeem it through there, you don't get the greatest value. Often have I found that I have trouble sometimes when I check in or checking in for my flight and they're like, oh, you booked through a third party. If the flight gets delayed, then you have to go through the third party in order to get your money back. It just adds a whole different level of complexity. Whereas if you transfer the points to the actual company and book through them, 
not only do you get a better deal, but you also get treated better because you get better service because you are in their system and they can see that you use their loyalty points. So it makes a big difference to your travel experience. Yeah, 100%. I agree with you. For the most part, I usually recommend to people that they do not ever redeem their points strictly or straight through their credit card account, their credit card travel portal. And there are these two big reasons. One is just the math, right? You can get so much more value from your points by transferring them out. And I can give you an extreme example of what that looks like. But then the second point that you touched on too, which is just the convenience factor, I agree with you because these are third-party platforms. You're not booking through Chase Bank itself. You're not booking straight through the airline itself. And so if you have any trouble, even if you don't want to change or cancel your flight, but as we have all experienced, I think in travel recently, things happen. Airlines do have cancellations. They have to reroute airlines, you know, and in the event that something about your itinerary or travel plans change either on your end or just the airline or hotels. And you're sort of stuck in this black hole. You go to the airline, like you said, and they say, well, you didn't book through us. You booked through Chase or whoever. Go talk to them. You go to Chase and they say, well, we're not operating the flight. You know, you got to go talk to the airline. And I think a lot of us are busy enough and have enough other things going on in our lives that kind of the last thing we want to do is play this like phone tag between these huge entities, neither one of which ultimately want to take responsibility for something. And so straight from just a convenience factor, I think it is so much more preferable to book directly through an airline or hotel. But as I mentioned, I think the math factor is also incredibly compelling. And I think this is the piece that so many people, especially in the beginning, don't truly understand how big a difference it can make in the bottom line of what they can potentially save or how much value they can get from their points by clicking a button, moving them out of their credit card account and into an airline or hotel account. So I'm going to give you, again, this is a very extreme example. This is not going to be your experience every time you redeem points. But I wanted to use this just so people can start to get a sense of, wait a minute, this is what is actually potentially possible. So I was just online yesterday, kind of bouncing around and looking at potential flights. You can book with points. This is what I do (laughs) in my (laughs) spare time for entertainment. There's an airline that's based in Germany. It's called Lufthansa. Maybe people in the audience are really familiar with it. And they run a ton of flights in between the United States and then their bases in Frankfurt and Munich. And then basically all over the world from there, right? All over Europe, you can get to India, places in Africa, Asia. And Lufthansa Airlines is one of the airlines that still maintains a first class cabin. So not only do they have a regular economy cabin, premium economy and business class, but they even have a first class cabin, which is like their highest kind of class of service. And so not shockingly, these can be very expensive cash flights to book out of pocket. One of the flights that Lufthansa runs is between Boston and Munich. And I was just looking at what flights have availability to book with points. And this specific flight had availability to book business class and first class on points. And so just for fun, I looked up, okay, let's just pretend I was going to book this flight from Boston to Munich in first class using cash. Honestly, I don't think I would ever do this unless I won the lottery and literally had like billions of dollars. But, you know, just for fun, I was like, oh, what would a person have to pay if they wanted to pay for a seat in this first class cabin? And that particular flight that day, that one way flight, right? So not round trip, this one way flight was pricing out if you want to book it straight through Lufthansa at $14,000. One way? One way, not a little amount of money. And I also want to say, you know, for people who are familiar sort of with like that geographic route, that's not even that terribly long of a flight. Like, yes, it is international. It is long haul. But when you're going from the East Coast to Europe, we're not talking about a 20 hour flight versus like when you fly JFK to Singapore, which is an actual flight. I mean, that is, you know, like 100 million hours. And so for an East Coast to Europe flight that isn't going to be 25 hours in length, it's like, okay, you know, $14,000 for that flight. Now, if you wanted to book that flight, Again, I'm just going to use Chase as the example because it's just a very easy, straightforward example. If you want to book that flight, just using your Chase points strictly through your Chase account, Chase assigns a value to your points. They say, okay, depending on which of our cards you're holding, we are going to tell you how much your points are worth. And so let's talk about for people who hold the Chase Sapphire Reserve, which is a really popular travel rewards card from Chase. Chase says, okay, if you have this card, every single point that you earn is worth one and a half cents. So whether you have a million points or 10 points or 100 points, they're all worth one and a half cents. So in order to book that specific flight, a $14,000 flight with Chase points, if you wanted to book straight through your Chase account, you would need 933,000 Chase points. It is possible to earn that many points, but you're not going to do that by accident. No one's just going to accidentally earn 933,000 Chase points, but you can absolutely do it. All right. Now, 
Let's compare that to what happens and what your options are if all you do instead is leverage one of the airlines that Chase partners with. And they have a whole menu. It's not just one. And so you have a lot of options, which is amazing. One of the options of Chase Transfer Partners is United Airlines. And so you can book Lufthansa flights through United Airlines because they're part of what's called an alliance, like a group of airlines that allow you to book on each other's airplanes through their different programs. If you wanted to book that Lufthansa first class flight through United, I just want you to take a guess. Complete conjecture. How many Chase points do you think you would have to move over from your Chase account to United to book the same flight that Chase would want you to pay 933,000 points for? Gosh, I mean, if you could just have that, that would still be a good deal. So let's say 400,000. Yeah, right. That would be an amazing deal. Like who wouldn't want to get double the value from their points? Well, this happens to be what is called a sweet spot in the points and miles world, which is basically just code for this is a really fantastic deal. Because if you want to book through United, you can book, again, that same exact flight, like same airplane, same seat, same everything for 121,000 points. What? Yes. And because Chase, like I mentioned before, has multiple different airline partners. So you could book that same flight through United for 121,000 points. You can book the same exact flight through Air Canada, which is also a Chase transfer partner for 90,000 points. Or you can book that same exact flight through another Chase transfer partner called Avianca which is an airline that is based in South America and book 87,000 points. And I'm not talking about flying a United flight or flying an Air Canada flight. Every single one of these flights is that same exact Lufthansa airplane, same exact Lufthansa flight. It's just different ways of booking it. So you can use 87,000 chase points to book a $14,000 flight, or you can use 933,000 chase points to book a $14,000 Lufthansa flight. And again, I specifically picked like what is one of the more outrageous but entirely real examples that I can find to illustrate this. So this is not going to be the experience every single time you book. But what I want people to take away from this is really just this simple idea that your points are usually going to be worth the least if you use them to book travel straight through your credit card account. And this example, like I said, to get a $14,000 flight for 87,000 points that is a redemption value of 16 cents per point. So where Chase is saying, you know, we're just going to give you enough travel such that you can get one and a half cents per point from all your points. This example is getting 16 times that amount. And you are not always going to do that. But to give people a more reasonable estimate of like, okay, I know I don't want to get one for one and a half cents per point, probably not going to get 16 cents per point every time I book. What can I reasonably expect to be able to do if I want to learn, again, some of the basics about the way this works? I think that you can reasonably expect to get at least two or three cents per point when you're moving your points out of your credit card account. And there are definitely opportunities to get significantly more than that. You can very easily get four to seven cents per point when you start learning some of these sweet spots. And so I want people to just take away that if the only thing you've ever done is use your credit card points for travel through your credit card account, that is not a bad thing. I just want to open up that door of possibility for you to understand that your points can be worth two or three times or more when you start learning how you can leverage some of these options that your credit card company already has set up for you, right? Like it's not something that's like a backdoor secret thing. It's literally just a different button that you push in your credit card account. It's just that so many people don't understand that this is even a possibility that's available to them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I tried to explain this to my friends and I have trouble you know, when we start talking numbers and ratios, people start to glaze over. So can you tell us exactly, you know, just so we understand how you're calculating these things and what the baseline is? So the baseline is, say, one and a half cents per point. And then how are you calculating the 16 cents per point? Yes, the baseline, again, each different bank basically internally assigns a value to their own points, and they will tell you what that value is, or it's very easy to calculate, right? And it depends, it varies between the banks, anywhere between one and about one and a half cents per point, where if you're going to use your points strictly through your credit card account itself, that's kind of the ceiling, that's the max amount of value that you're going to get out of your points. And so if you want to start looking at what are some of these other options, how would I be able to know if I did take advantage of one of these options, how much value am I getting from my points? It's a pretty straightforward calculation. So what I look at is how many points is required for me to book a flight through one of these airlines themselves. So again, in the example of Avianca, it's 87,000 points, right? Then I look at if I was going to book the same exact flight, you know, directly through the airline in cash for this day of travel, what is the airline charging for that? So in this example, it was $40,000. Oftentimes, especially when it comes to booking a flight using your points, 
the flight itself, you pay for using points, but all airlines have an out-of-pocket cost as well. And that's things like taxes or fees that the airline charges. And so that can range from as little as like $5 on a flight. It can go up pretty high depending on what airline you're booking through. But for this specific example, Avianca, for that 87,000 point flight, the taxes and fee component, the out-of-pocket cash component for that flight is 140 US dollars. And so the way that you calculate the redemption value is you take the cash cost of the flight itself, so 14,000, then I subtract out whatever taxes or fees I'd have to pay out of pocket. So 14,000 minus 140, right? So you get a number from that. And then you take that number divided by 87,000 points because 87,000 points are the number of points you're going to use for the flight. And the number that you result from, that is the cents per point of value that you would get from that specific redemption. And so you can do this for any flight or any hotel stay that you're thinking about booking using your points. So now we have a baseline to compare. So one-to-one, let's just say that's the baseline of a redemption. And then if you can get better than that, then you know you're getting a good deal. And if you can get up to 16 cents per point, then you're really, you know, you're getting an excellent deal. I mean, I would say 16 is like beyond phenomenal. You know, like this is very subjective. There's no objective, (laughs) you know, like measurement where everybody agrees on, you know, what's good and what's bad. But, you know, in my opinion, having done this for a lot of years, I think, again, if you're getting two to three cents per point, that's really solid. That's probably double the value that you're getting from your points if you're just redeeming them through your credit card portal. So think about that, right? Like if you could use the same amount of points and just get twice as many tickets somewhere, right? Or stay twice as many days in a hotel. I think that's pretty darn good. And then, like I said, you know, that's just a getting two to three cents per point when you know that there are opportunities out there to get four, five, six, seven or more cents per point then I think that is such a substantial difference, right? Like talking about that example, for someone who has 933,000 chase points, it's like, okay, you can use that for $14,000 in value. Or if you have 933,000 points, and instead of getting one and a half cents per point, you know, you're just getting three cents per point in value, that's already almost $28,000 in travel. I think that people just because they don't hear conversations about this enough, that they really don't realize how much value these points can potentially have, especially when you pair it with that first part of the equation that we were talking about, which is the points earning, where when you get even just a little bit skilled about earning points, where you're not earning one point for every dollar spent, you're learning some of these different methods to earn four points per dollar spent, or in the case of earning a welcome bonus, sometimes that's as many as 15 or 20 points per dollar spent. All of a sudden you're saying, wait a minute, I don't have to spend $930,000 to earn 930,000 points. And, you know, I can get four or five times the value of those points. Like when you really optimize both sides of that equation, I think that is where you're seeing people who are really getting substantial amounts of value out of their points. And that's what I hope to show people is at least possible. Like you don't have to get as deep into this hobby any deeper than you want to get, but just start by understanding like what is the potential that exists here? Yeah, I mean, You also described this game where you went on to the Chase Sapphire Reserve, the rewards portal, and then you went to Air Canada and United. And I can say most of us probably don't have an account in every one of these airlines. Is there an app? Someone's got to have something where you can compare the redemptions and see what it is on the different airlines and the travel partners and all of that. Here's what's really, really interesting is that There is not right now one entirely comprehensive platform. Like so many of us are familiar with Google flights, right? If we want to just price out flights, get an idea of, you know, if I want to take my family, you know, to Florida for spring break from Chicago, where I live, let me go to Google flights, type in the starting place, the destination, my dates of travel. It's going to show me essentially most of the airlines that are going to fly that route. And then I can very quickly compare you know, is United cheaper than American or is Delta going to offer me the best flight for my itinerary? So that's convenient, right? There is no analogous platform right now for points that is that comprehensive to where you can just say, I want to again, fly from Chicago to Florida, tell me everything that's available, all the different points prices. So then I can just pick the one I want and go straight to that airline. I actually think that that's a good thing and a bad thing. But it's just the way that it is right now. And so I think part of what has been challenging about this hobby traditionally is that there is no one-stop shop. And so in order to be able to learn about some of these opportunities, in order to be able to really maximize the value of your points, 
what it has required is that people have had to invest at least, you know, a baseline amount of time in order just to learn some of these approaches and be willing to, like you said, let me go to United's website and see what their points price is for a flight. And then let me go to Americans website, do the same thing so that I can manually compare the two. And again, I think that there are pros and cons to that more manual approach. But I think one of the things that I have seen, especially over about the 10 years that I've been in this hobby, especially over the last year or two, is that technology is advancing. This used to be something that was so kind of challenging to navigate that unless you had a computer science degree, you probably weren't involved in this hobby at all, really, because you had to do so much manual navigation, so much information. It was just so hard for people to be able to find it. And especially as the internet has advanced, you know, so many different apps have come up. It has become so much easier for people who I think are probably more leisure hobbyists, like not the people who are just really insane about this, like I am, to be able to take advantage of these things. And so there are some platforms now that, again, they're not entirely comprehensive. They don't cover every single airline that you can use to book flights through using points, but they are starting to pop up these sort of aggregators, right, where it's a beginning step where you can type in where you're going, when you want to go there, and you can at least get a comparison of a few airlines and the points prices for those hotels. And so some of these platforms, people may be familiar with them. One of them is a website called points.ya. Most of these platforms have a free version and a paid version. There's a lot more functionality if you have the subscription, the fee-based version, but it's a place that people can get started. And especially the free version, because there's no risk to it whatsoever, you can at least kind of start playing around with it to see kind of if it's useful for you or not. But where sort of the landscape of using points is right now, I still think that the most value is going to be held in areas that right now are not accessible by these sort of like aggregate platforms. And so it is worth it to learn some basic approaches to using points. And again, I think people see this sometimes in a very binary way. It's either like, oh my gosh, you know, there's so much to learn or there are so many details that either I have to dedicate essentially like (laughs) make this a full-time job, a second full-time job for me to get any value out of it, or it's just not worth it at all, right? Like, there's no point in doing this. And I think there's this huge middle zone. I think that there are people who, because of their own personal interests, the way their brain works, you know, the dopamine they get from finding a great deal, they are going to want to go, you know, all the way down the rabbit hole and learn all of these super advanced techniques. But there's so many people who don't have an interest in doing that. And learning just a couple of approaches, becoming familiar with just a couple of different airline opportunities for points you can still get so much more value out of your points than just doing nothing with them. And so I want to encourage people that it's not all or nothing. It's not either you don't really know anything about this hobby or you have to become, again, you know, like a full-time investment in order to be able to get anything worthwhile. There's so much gray zone in between. And I think about this the same way that I honestly think about learning medicine. You know, I don't think any of us steps into our first day of residency and looks at a subspecialist in our field and thinks, oh my gosh, that's what I'm supposed to know, or I'm supposed to learn all of that in one day, right? That would be entirely impossible. There's a reason why med school is a couple years long. There's a reason why residencies and fellowships are a couple of years long, right? Because it's this accumulation of knowledge and skill. And I think that's true of any area that we want to learn about. And the great news about points and miles is that it doesn't require 80 hours of work a week in grueling circumstances for four or five years to be able to get to the point where you can be pretty, pretty skilled at doing this. And so I want to give people who are like, I don't know about this. Like, I don't know if I really want to learn about five different, you know, airline programs or really how to navigate all this. I just want to give you permission that you don't ever have to do that if you don't want to. You can learn one or two really solid things and still get a ton of value out of it. Yeah, Devin, actually, I love that graph. I love one page summaries. That's like my favorite way to learn and just visualize the big picture and all the details that are involved in it. And I love how you made your travel partner sheet with the alliances. And if you don't mind sharing that with our audience, we would love to include a link to that because I think that really helps everyone kind of understand or help me understand the bigger picture of the alliances and the travel partners and how you can transfer points to one airline, but then actually book it to another airline and so forth and kind of a place to start. Imagine Dr. Emily, a skilled and passionate physician, standing at a pivotal moment in her career path. She has just received a contract offer and is surrounded by uncertainty. Is the offer fair? Does it align with her career goals? 
This is where Contract Diagnostics shines. Their nationwide expertise, encompassing every state and specialty, positions them as the go-to ally for physicians. When they dove into Dr. Emily's contract, it wasn't just a review. They demystified complex clauses and provided enlightening insights tailing their approach to her specific needs. Regardless of whether you're taking your first steps as a new graduate or navigating as an established doctor, Contract Diagnostics delivers a tailored, comprehensive contract review, perfectly suited to your individual situation. Now, it's your turn to secure your future. Reach out to Contract Diagnostics at 888-574-5526 or visit contractdiagnostics.com. Begin your empowering career journey today, and I'll be cheering for you from the other side. Let's transition now from talking about how to get the most value of our points. Let's talk about how can we earn points more efficiently? Because, you know, even 87,000 points for one ticket, one way, still a lot of points, right? And a lot of us, you know, don't have the hundreds of thousands of points sitting around at all times. So how can we maximize how we earn? You know, you talked about getting cards that already align with the way you spend. Give us a few pointers on how to better accumulate points. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, again, when I'm thinking about the sort of common phases that people go through when they start learning about this hobby, I think a very common phase that most people start in is that they have one credit card. And I think there's a lot of good reasons for this. This was me for many years, right? I needed a single credit card. So if I had to put things, you know, on credit, I had one accessible to me. And for some people, that might be like an airline specific credit card, right? Maybe you live in an area of the country where you have an airline hub and that's the only airline you basically ever fly. And it's great to get, you know, free checked bags or whatever. So you have one single credit card. And I think when people get into this, you know, hobby or this game, however you want to think about it, I think one of the first phases in terms of thinking about how do I construct what I call a credit card portfolio, which is just what is your collection of credit cards that's going to be most useful for you to earn points? I think one of the most important steps initially is to get, again, what I call one of the transferable points, earning cards. And all that means is that you have a credit card for one of the major issuers where when you put expenses on that card, the form of rewards that you are earning are points that are not locked in to being used only on one airline or only one hotel. So like a Delta credit card is an example of an airline credit card where if you put a lot of spend or expenses on your Delta credit card, you're earning Delta miles. That's wonderful if all you ever want to do is use your miles with Delta, but you can't book any other airline like outside of Delta and their partners with those points. This is in contrast to something like the American Express points earning cards, the Chase points earning cards, There's a fantastic card by a company called Built that lets you earn points for your rent, which can be a huge expense for a lot of people. So, oh, we can get very deep into that topic. But the whole point of this is that just understanding that having a transferable points earning card is going to give you a lot more options than a card that only earns cash back or only earns rewards within one single program, like an Amazon card, right? Or a store specific credit card or an airline specific credit card. So for a lot of people, just getting one, what I consider a foundational transferable points earning card is a good place to start. And then you can use that as long as you want until you're ready to add complexity to the system. And for some people, that could be months or years or never. And for some people, who start saying, oh, the more I layer on additional opportunities, the easier and faster I can earn points, they're going to want to move on from that step pretty quickly. But I think that's a first great step for everybody. Just one solid foundational transferable points earning credit card. And then beyond that, I think it starts to make a lot of sense, again, to identify where are those categories of expenses that I tend to spend the most money on? Is it rent? Is it groceries? Is it you know, dining or eating out or having food delivery? Is it travel? You know, a lot of us still do spend money on travel, even when we are leveraging our points and miles to defray that cost. And you want to be really intentional about picking out cards that are going to give you extra points when you spend money on those expenses. And then my third tip that I think comes in, again, for people who kind of ready to expand their credit card portfolio a little bit is that for anyone who has done a pretty detailed budget, you know, like on a monthly basis or an annual basis, and you have a really good sense of 
how much money am I spending just overall? And where is my money going? Right? Like a lot of us can categorize that X amount of expenses are going towards like my kids, right? Like that could be a huge (laughs) bucket for a lot of us or X amount of, you know, my budget is going towards rent towards groceries. What you will find as you start to learn more about a lot of these credit cards is that for the majority of us, a lot of the money that we spend is what I call non-category spent. It's going to be on stuff that none of the points earning cards are going to give you a ton of bonus points for. So like your online shopping, right? Like if you are purchasing things from online stores for yourself or for your family members, pretty much any points earning card is going to allow you to earn one point for every dollar you spend in that way. And that's true for all of us. Most of the money that we spend is probably not going to fall neatly into one of these great bonus categories on a points earning card. And that is where the importance of having a points earning card that gives you increased points, regardless of what you spend on becomes important. And I'm just going to give you two examples of this two very popular cards. One of them is the Capital One, the Venture cards. The way the reward structure is created is that you just get two Capital One points for every dollar you spend, regardless of what you're spending money on. Like it's such an easy, straightforward way to earn points. And at two points for every dollar spent, right, you're earning twice as many points than all the other credit cards that are only going to earn you one point for every dollar spent. And so that is one example of a really solid card that gives you increased points earning for anything that's going to fall outside of a traditional bonus category on another one of your credit cards. And another example of that in the Chase world or the Chase points ecosystem is a card called the Chase Freedom Unlimited. And this is a great card because there's no annual fee. It's not going to cost you money if you want to hold on to it and use it for 10 years or 20 years. And it earns 1.5 Chase points for anything that you put on it. And there's no cap to the amount of points that you can earn on it. And so I think for people who do want to start using more than one rewards card, they start to understand these concepts of, oh, by having two or three different points earning cards, I can actually really elevate my ability to earn points quickly. I think these are kind of the three main components you want to hit. You want to get a transferable points earning card, so Chase, Amex, Built, City, or Capital One card. Then you want to add cards probably within that same points ecosystem that give you a lot of extra bonus points for the categories that you tend to spend money on. And then finally, just add in one solid points earning card, probably from that same points currency that just gives you more than one point per dollar spent on all of your spend. And really between those three things, that is going to elevate your points earning incredibly substantially. And like I said, we can always add complexity to this system, but those three steps, I think are a really, really good starting space. Yeah, that sounds amazing. And thank you for explaining that so clearly. What if, you know, you're married, like, for example, me, I'm married and I'm really into points, but my husband is not. And we have like 50 different cards now and it's getting really complex. Whereas like I kind of know off the top of my head what each card does. He does it. How do you track that? How do you educate your partner on how what card does put what on? Yeah, you know, I think this is such a great topic. So many of us do, you know, have partners. And I would say it is highly unusual for two people in a partnership to have the same level of interest and enthusiasm about like 99% of the time, you know, there's one person who has a medium to very high level of interest and enthusiasm. And the other one can vary anywhere between like neutral to I don't like this, I don't want to be involved in it, or it's just too complicated, you know, leave me out of it. And one of the things that I want to say is that that is fine, right? Like if you happen to be the person who is way more interested and enthusiastic about this whole thing than your partner, let them be where they are, right? Like you still earn a lot of points with you as a sole or primary points earner. I think, of course, it's great if your partner is, you know, compliant or, you know, if they're interested, if they want to do this together, you know, two people earning points, you can do that at a faster rate than one person. But it's not mandatory, right? It is not a requirement for you to be able to do a lot with points that your partner has to be on the same exact page as you. So I just want people to know that, right? Like, don't feel like you have to force them into this or that you don't have a lot of opportunities if your partner just says, hey, I'm comfortable with my one card. Like, I really don't want to carry more than one card. But for people whose partners are compliant, you know, there's a couple of different ways that you can do this. This is my experience where my husband basically only knows as much about this as I want to tell him. And he's like, I'll do what you ask me to do, but like make it easy for me. We've navigated this as well. And for him, I think what has made it easy for him, and this is going to sound very basic, but this is what has worked for us. Like I will label credit cards. Like I will stick a sticker 
on a credit card and write the word grocery, right? So he knows then when he's at the store, like he doesn't have to do that mental work of, okay, if I've got four credit cards in my wallet, like which one has bonus points for groceries and which one has bonus points for gas? Like I don't ask him to care about that or want to remember that. He's enough other things, you know, that he has to remember. So if I can make it easy by giving him like literally these visual cues of like, this is the card for grocery or this is the card again for, if you don't know, just use this one card because this is our non-category card that at least is going to earn us extra points, you know, for any spend. So you can make it easy for your partner. And and what that looks like is going to depend, right, on just your communication style, what works for both of you. There are apps that you can use that you can upload the cards that you have, and then it will tell you, you know, of your cards, this is the best one to use for certain expenses. I personally don't use those just because I don't like linking my credit cards or my bank accounts up in apps. I think that's just a personal preference. I think there are some lower tech, more manual ways that you can go about communicating with your partner to make it really easy for them. Physicians have a lot of educational expenses. Obviously, we have student loans and we also need to be saving for our kids in their 529s. These accounts are directly linked to bank. It's a direct transfer. Is there any way we can find to earn points on those student loan payments or 529 contributions? Great question, because I think one of my philosophies about points earning is that let's look for the opportunities where we can earn the most amount of points as easily as possible. And one of the ways we can do that is by looking at what are my largest expenses and how can I earn points on those expenses? And when we're talking about things like 529 contributions, paying down student loans, for a lot of us, These are significant investments that we are making. And so, yes, if there's a way that we can earn points on that, I am all for let's figure this out and let's make it really easy. And here's kind of the situation right now, because these things do change over time. Different opportunities come, different opportunities go. But the way that the landscape looks right now is that there is kind of one main way that we can earn points when we're making contributions to 529 plans or doing student loan payments. And that is through a platform called Gift of College. And this is a platform that essentially allows you as an individual to buy gift cards and then give them to other people. That's how it's set up to give to other people to use against their educational expenses. So, you know, if there's a high school senior in your family and they're graduating and you want to get them a $200 Gift of College gift card, they can put that towards their college account, whatever the case may be. But you can leverage this for yourself as well. There are a couple of different ways that you can purchase Gift of College gift cards. And the way this system works is that Gift of College is a website. It's an online platform. And when you do have Gift of College gift cards, you can link your Gift of College account up to 529 accounts, more than one. If you have more than one for more than one beneficiary, you can link it up with your student loan processor so that you can actually use funds like on Gift of College gift cards to either make contributions to 529 accounts or to make student loan payments. So that's like the basic structure of how this works. But first, you need to get Gift of College gift cards to have funds to then move into a 529 account or to pay down your student loans. And there are two main approaches for this right now. So you can go and purchase physical Gift of College gift cards and use a points earning card to pay for that gift card. So you're going to earn points based on the purchase price of the Gift of College gift card. And then you can go and load that gift card up on your gift of college account. And again, make your 529 contributions or your student loan payments. Now, one thing for people to understand about this is that the physical gift of college gift cards right now, they're very geographically limited. So they're not available all over the country. If you go to the giftofcollege.com website, they have a gift card locator where you can see exactly where these gift cards are offered. They're mostly offered in Texas and in some areas of California. And then there's like one state in the Northeast. So the vast majority of us are actually not going to have access to the gift of college gift cards. But if they are in your area, I think this is an amazing opportunity to go and purchase, especially the highest denomination that you can get as a $500 denomination to go and purchase a $500 gift of college gift card with a credit card that's going to earn you points for that purchase. And then use your gift of college gift cards to make your contributions to your 529 account and paying down your student loans. But for those of us that don't have access to those, like I live in the Chicago area, we don't have those $500 gift of college gift cards anywhere I can drive. And I do some pretty insane things, but like, I'm not going to get on a plane and fly down to Austin, you know, for the day just to load up (laughs) like gift of college gift cards. I briefly considered it, but I was like, no, even I'm not going to go ahead and do this. 
there are some options available to us. And this is for anybody who, again, does not have gift of college gift cards, those physical cards available to them in their geographic location, or for anybody who actually doesn't want to or doesn't need to earn credit card points. But one of my philosophies is let's always try, again, to maximize our return on our investments. And so I think what most of us are probably doing is like you said, directly contributing to a 529 account straight from our bank account, like a direct bank transfer, or same thing, direct bank transfer to pay down our student loans. And I want people to be aware of this second approach or this second option that is available to all of us, where at least you can earn some cash back for those contributions and payments. And that approach, it's still by getting gift of college gift cards, but instead of having to pick up physical gift cards from a grocery store, you know, or a gas station, which is where a lot of these are sold, is that you can go through an online website called Flues. I'll give you the link of information for the show notes. It's spelled F-L-U-Z. And Flues is just a cashback portal where you can go on Flues, you can make purchases, and you get cashback rewards based on the amount of money that you're spending on that platform. And you can purchase gift of college gift cards on Flues. And the way it works is you don't purchase with a credit card. So again, you're not going to earn credit card points, but you can purchase a gift of college gift card on Flues, again, directly from your bank. But every time you purchase one of those, you get 1.5% cash back on the purchase price, right? And I know 1.5% doesn't sound like this huge, amazing amount. But again, when we're thinking about how much money over time are we contributing over time to 529 accounts? You know, this can be multiple five figures. It can be multiple six figures. You know, I had multiple six figures of student loans that I was paying down. And I think if you really consider, wait a minute, if there's an opportunity for me to earn 1.5% cash back on multiple five figures or multiple six figures, is it worth it for me to go to a website and click a button in order to do that when I'm already making these payments and these contributions anyway? So these are the two main methods that you can utilize to either just earn straight cash back or to earn points on those types of expenses. That's a huge hack. I mean, and I think this would be really useful for people that are just very motivated to get every bit of value out of every dollar, right? Every dollar spent. It probably is not a great option for people that like automation and want to not have to think about it. But for people that are wanting to, you know, up their game and how fast they're earning points, this would be a really excellent way to do it. I just, out of curiosity, went onto the 529 New York Saves site, you know, tried to just gift my kids some money through their U-Gift code, but you can't do it with a credit card. You have to do it either with a direct transfer or a check. So this is one way where you could put that payment on a credit card, spend the same amount of money and get points for it. But of course, we don't get something for nothing. There must be fees associated with this, right? When you're doing the option that I was talking about, the cashback option, where if you want to go to the Flues website and you purchase the gift of college gift cards, again, through a bank, so you're not using a credit card, but you are earning one and a half percent cash back, that there's no fee, right? It truly is. Let me use money from my bank account, purchase the gift of college gift card, whatever amount I spend on that, I'm getting one and a half percent cash back through Flues. So that's one approach. The approach where you're actually going into physical locations and purchasing a gift of college gift card, again, the denominations range, but the highest amount that you can purchase is $500. Those gift cards do come with an activation fee. So you're putting whatever contribution you want on the card, and then you're having to pay. And it varies based on the denomination of card available to you. But you're going to pay either about $5.95 or $6.95 to get that physical gift card. And so that is an out-of-pocket cost. Now, some people have an approach where they don't ever want to pay an additional fee in order to be able to use a credit card for a purchase to make points. I think that's entirely valid. If that is your approach, those are your priorities, I totally get it. I never try to convince people out of doing something that works for them. But people who understand that the potential value of the points that you can earn can far outweigh the cost of that fee. And that is interesting and compelling to them, like they want to make that trade. Then one of the ways that you can really leverage this, again, is that you want to make sure that you are getting those $500 denomination gift of college gift cards, because a $5.95 activation fee for a $500 gift card is a much better return on investment for the points you're going to earn than if you're going to buy a $25 gift of college gift card and pay a $5.95 fee, right? Like, I think at that point, the math doesn't math. But yes, and that is the whole entire thing is that 
there are opportunities for you to be able to earn points by paying for certain expenses with a points earning credit card that may entail a processing fee or an activation fee. And my philosophy is, again, it's not binary. It's not that I think everyone should absolutely do that. I don't think that. But I also think you shouldn't necessarily just completely write it off. Just understand how do I do the math so that I can figure out if the value of the points I'm going to be earning for this expense far outweighs the fee that I'm going to have to pay in order to earn those points. Is that something that matters to me? Right. And so some people are going to do that math and decide, oh, heck, yeah, it, it is worth it for me to be able to earn points on, again, what can be five or six figures of expenses over time. Other people are going to do the math and say, hey, that's just not where I want to go. Right. All I want to do is earn points on all of my regular expenses. And where I draw my personal line is I don't want to have to use a credit card if it's ever going to entail a processing fee. And so Again, I do not think one approach is better or right compared to the other. I think it's all about really understanding what are your personal priorities and goals and understanding how to do the math so that you can make an educated decision for yourself. Yeah. So if you're getting, say, 500 points for the $500 gift card that you purchase, you're getting, what, $5 of value at one cent per point? Right. And I guess this is where understanding kind of what is your confidence that you're going to get one cent per point of value from your points versus five or six cents, right? And also what you just said was, yeah, you know, if you're going to buy a $500 gift card and earn 500 points, and then those 500 points are going to be worth one cents per point, I would argue, no, that's not worth it. I would not, you know, if, if I had one of my private clients who I do consulting with, if they came to me and said, this is the scenario, should I do this? I would say, hey, I don't think the math makes sense for you, right? But if you have a credit card that's going to earn you, let's say, three or four times points for that expense, where a $500 charge is actually going to earn you 1,500 points or 2,000 points, and you have a level of confidence based on your experience that you're not going to turn 2,000 points into you know, $20, you're going to actually be able to get five times the value out of that. Okay, well, then maybe in that scenario, it does make sense. And that's why I say these things are not binary, right? And it all comes back to this idea of just being able to over time increase your skill level, right? Like the very baseline skill level is earning one point for every dollar you spend and then turning every single one of those points around for one cents, right? Like that's the very baseline. As you increase skill in this hobby, if you are getting yourself up to the point where instead of earning one point for all of your expenses, again, you're earning two, three, four, up to 15 points for every dollar. And you're not only getting one cent per point of value, but you're getting two, three, four, five, seven. Then the math starts looking very differently around some of these specific questions. But what I always tell people is like, if you don't know like how to do that math yet, then err on the side of caution, right? Don't start doing the sorts of things where in order to use a points earning credit card for an expense, you are going to be required to pay a fee. If you don't yet have that high confidence of earning a lot of points for that expense, and or getting a lot of value out of those points. So you don't ever have to start in that place, like start where your comfort zone is. And as you build your skill and build your education, that can be something that begins to make sense for you over time. That's not something that I would have done, you know, my first year in this hobby. I've been doing this for 10 years now. And because my confidence level is high that I'm going to be able to turn a lot of my points into a lot of value, the threshold for me to be willing to pay a fee to use a credit card to pay an expense, like for my estimated taxes, right? For college gift cards. I'm very comfortable doing that, but that doesn't mean that everybody needs to start in that same place. I think for me, it would probably be to get $5 value and pay $3 in fees. It's not worth it. But if I were able to maybe buy $3,000 worth of gift college gift cards to get a sign on bonus for a card that, you know, I don't have any big major spends coming up and I might not be able to meet and that'd be an easy way to get that sign on bonus, then that would be worth it for me. And I think that that's like such a great point, because again, just because one time the math makes sense for you to do that, to make a big purchase and have to pay a fee, it doesn't mean that every single time you have to do the same thing, right? Like you can do that analysis, like when does this make sense? Not I'm either going to do it all the time or I'm never going to do it. I think that that's such a great example of a scenario where it could make a lot of sense one time to be able to do it. And then maybe you don't purchase those gift cards for the next eight months or the next year until it makes sense for you again. That sounds like a really interesting hack. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you for sharing your time with us again. I'm so happy to have you on every time. And I just love these conversations because it just opens up a world of opportunity. Are there any last pieces of wisdom or nuggets that you'd like to leave with our audience today? Sure. You know, I know that I have said this, but I really just want to reiterate it, which is that 
this hobby in this game, it's as involved as you want it to be, right? So I love people to understand there's a ton of potential value here. And even if you don't want to take it all the way to the end, there's still some really easy approaches you can take to make it worth your time. And so learn it at a pace that makes sense for you and leverage some of these points earning or points redeeming opportunities to the extent that they make sense for you and know that there's no one right way to do this hobby. It's really about having fun, getting a lot more value out of the money that you're already spending and being able to have some wonderful travel experiences. And so please don't feel like it has to look one way in order for it to be done right. There's so many ways to benefit from this hobby. Thank you so much, Devin. Have a great day. And I can't wait to have you back again. Thank you so much. I have loved our conversation as I always do. Thank you for your time. And I can't wait to talk even more about this another time. That's a wrap for today's enlightening session on advanced credit card point hacking with the expert herself, Dr. Devin Gimbel. For our listeners aspiring to transform their travel dreams into reality, be sure to delve into the wealth of knowledge and resources available on Devin's platform. Details are in the show notes for easy access. Remember, credit card points can be like playing with fire. Make sure that you are paying off credit card bills monthly and not carrying a balance forward. If you're able to do that, you'll be able to maximize your travel with point hacking. Thank you for joining us on Finding Financial Freedom with The Frugal Physician. Don't forget to subscribe, leave a review, and follow us for more insightful episodes dedicated to refining your financial and travel hacking skills. Until our next journey, stay frugal, y'all. Now, a final word from our sponsor. At Pearson Rabbits, they understand that life can change in an instant. It's hard to imagine that a sudden illness, injury, or catastrophic event could put you and your family in a devastating financial situation. Physician-founded and physician-focused, Pearson Rabbits builds human connections before they create quotes. Visit www.pearsonrabbits.com today and embark on your journey to safeguarding your future. The content shared on this podcast should not be taken as individualized financial advice. We are here to share our knowledge and experiences, but it is crucial to consult with professionals such as accountants, financial advisor, or attorneys who can provide personalized guidance based on your specific needs.